we met Pat and Oswald a few weeks ago, or, you know, when we were, JD Raymer and I went to go uh, to a comic book shop nearby where he was appearing for a Save Our Store event. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the podcast or not, but like, this is real. Um, the cost of autographs was $2.50. I'm not like, that's not a joke. Like they were like, we're selling tickets for autographs for any of the signers inside the building for two for five dollars as a save our store event and so jd and i were like it's christmas you could steal city hall and like lost our minds about this we brought like we had no idea that we got there but we've each brought like 10 items a piece since so we walked up to Patton, we were like here's 10 items we looked like total insane people and they were all ghostbusters things don't shut it off i'm warning you <laughs> Welcome to Strange Glow Videos. Well, that's what I heard. Aren't you going to introduce me to your feet? Hosted by Alec, Justin, and Nick. Well, that's what I heard. Hey, welcome back to Strange Glow Video. My name is Justin. With me is my esteemed colleague and birthday boy brother, Alec. Welcome. And uh, we've got some special guests with us tonight. Also the birthday boy, Tony. Happy birthday, sir. And Thank uh, you. Jim Mercado from Extra Plasm. Tony, you know from Phantasm Toys, Tony Taylor Toys, and Alec, you know from his OnlyFans. It's <laughs> spicy. It's fun. <laughs> Subscribe and like and tip. He's ready for you. These would be fun, folks, if I didn't actually have an OnlyFans. What do you do on it, though? Do you like do something like completely inappropriate for OnlyFans? Like you're like, I teach math. I, I'm a math tutor on OnlyFans, and it's where you can tip me and pay me. I know it's not what people usually do there, but it's what I'm doing. No, see what I do is I put stuff in my butt. <laughs> <laughs> what everyone does on OnlyFans, I see. Exactly. I mean, you know, I was expecting a little more. <laughs> I think this is what I we mean, need to do is actually create a channel on OnlyFans where we just review Ghostbusters toys. Just to see what happens. Originally, yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> before we were did our Patreon, we were debating just starting an OnlyFans and using it as our Patreon. So we almost I mean, did. Yeah, just just because it would be different, be like, you know, that's kind of a really... Uh... Well, I went as far as signing up for... It was a frog... It was one of your frog bros still, so... Oh, yeah, that would have been really weird. <laughs> <laughs> frog Brothers Only Fans. Uh, what? Uh, the Human Pretzel. <laughs> I have a feeling like you may have suddenly gotten influx of subscribers from, like, Mississippi, Louisiana... Uh, you know, lots of places where people like frogs, brothers who like frogs. Let's go do that. But, yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> so obviously a uh, big day today. Riveted. <laughs> Riveted big for day my today. pleasure. <laughs> Sorry. Double birthday that. parties and our uh, esteemed colleague uh, Kip over at Let's Run Some Red Lights. His birthday is today, too. So lots of celebrating going on there today. And then, uh, Paul, you know, yeah. Paul, Paul Fusco's birthday. birthday, too. Can't forget him. Can't and Oprah about. Winfrey. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The best part of Oprah that she's ever done was Ghostbusters 2 episode. Like, she peaked at that. She should have just quit <laughs> after that day. The next day, she should have just gone in and thrown in the towel. That's the one that uh, Chris Farley attended, isn't it? Uh -huh. It is. Yeah, he's yeah. in the crowd, and, like, they show all the slime buckets and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair, I don't think she was giving away things like cars at that point or whatever, right? Like, I think that... I don't know if she started the, the book club yet. She There was a lot of potential there for people to get a lot of gifts. So if you go back in time and you just decide, like, hey, that's the peak Oprah, cancel it there, you're going to ruin a lot of futures. Be careful. So? It's butterfly flaps and it's wings. That's wing, called you know, bribery. If you have to be bribed <laughs> to go to Oprah's show, how good can it be? See, we're going to get All a lot of same. comments now. This uh, this is going to hit the algorithm because of the Oprah Winfrey thing. The, the, it's going to get transcribed, right? And then the yes. algorithm is going to pick up the Oprah Winfrey. Now we've said it like 400 times. Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey. Now it's really going to happen. <laughs> you, get happens, you get a comment. You get a comment. You get a comment. That's what I that's It's going to be all the Oprah so. fans. And we're going to get all the hate saying that Justin really hates the color purple. Just hates it. <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> I don't have an opinion on it. You know, I'm so stupid that I actually oh, well. thought you meant like the crayon color purple. My brain was like, <laughs> why do you not like purple? Purple is a perfectly fine color. It's one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, I really like the color purple. It really pops with the little pink boot slime, you know? It's kind of blends right yeah. in. It's nice. I got a Phantasm yeah. Toys uh, version of Viggy. It's in purple. It's really great. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Frozen Empire trailer dropped today, which technically oh. the last one they said was a teaser. This is the official trailer. Like the last one was two minutes. This is only like 35 seconds longer than the last release. <laughs> so, yeah, it's I guess funny. it's uh, 
it's it's trailer two as far as where I'm coming from and learning about the movie, but there's a lot of stuff to digest out of that. What do you guys uh, think? Initial thoughts there. That's a loaded uh, question. Yeah, I mean that is a loaded question. Yeah. I'll say that I'll start this off and maybe be um, potentially controversial, but probably not. I thought the trailer was fine. I thought the international trailer, which I'm going to call trailer 2.5, was mm -hmm. <clears throat> my preferred trailer. Like if I were going to show uh, a trailer to my parents or to my sister who's in her you know late 30s or uh, to my brother who's in his 40s who's not really into Ghostbusters, but these are all people who saw Afterlife on cable and we're like, hey, mm -hmm. that Ghostbusters movie that you were talking about for way too long during COVID, we watched it and it was actually pretty good. Like for them, I feel like that trailer would do a better job, like the international trailer in telling them why they should care about this movie. And I think kind of that the trailer that we got is our A trailer, you know, is our, our canon trailer rather than ours, our B canon trailer. Um, <laughs> it's sort of one that speaks to us well. It talks to us and shows us people that we want to see. Uh, and so it's not a bad trailer, but I kind of looked at both of them and went, wow, I kind of wish the international trailer was the trailer, you know, that was going to be seen more on U.S. media. But that's just me. So. Yeah, I could agree with that. Like as soon as I saw, I think it was the German Ghostbusters, I saw post the Italian version of the trailer, which is just the international trailer, right? So Sony Pictures, yeah. Italia, or um, I think when I finally found it, I got India. And that's what I wound up watching on there because they didn't have the dub. When I first watched the German version, it wasn't dubbed. And then when I went back and refreshed later on, they'd had the dub over it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I kept <laughs> looking around to find it because I was like, well, I don't, you know, I'm glad they're dubbing it, but I don't want to hear the dub. It doesn't make any sense to it's me. It's on Ghostbusters News. It's if you're looking for it, is that it is on the Ghostbusters News YouTube channel. You can find it there. Oh, awesome. I was also going to say that. That's where I've been watching it because I watched well, all of these. I watched them consecutively and then I went back and watched them in halftime as well. Okay, yeah. It's very so. awkward for dialogue, but like for catching <laughs> shit, you're like, oh, no, there's that. You're not I wrong. Went, I went one up and I got a little demented earlier. So I downloaded them and I went through frame by frame in certain parts of the trailers. And I was doing some screen grabs and kind of looking at things. And I'm just like, my wife is looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you know, I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you knew this, we knew this from day Perfectly one. If you're listening out there and you want to do that yourself, uh, I believe that like right before we started recording, uh, I'm a member of the Spook Central Patreon. And I got a notification that I believe Paul Rudolph has posted like 120 frames like out of the trailer okay. as a screen. I don't, I don't know if it's a full screened up of the trailer because I think it's like 120 images that are selected out of the trailer but it's you know a lot of them a full screen dump is probably i mean i can tell you it's probably thousands of images because we full screen dumped or rather jd raymer screen dumped uh the last trailer and we used it to generate eight by tens when we went to go see pat oswald so i have a folder that has like thousands of jpegs in it <laughs> that are just like yeah. blurry images of somebody moving across a scene but you know some of them are really good shots so i think that paul might have gone through and pulled the full clear shots and put together 120 of each of the trailers that you can go grab off of Spook Central if you wanted to. But oh that's awesome. So Alec, what were your thoughts when you first saw this? Uh I was very tired still. <laughs> and uh oh, oh, he, he was so tired that he froze. <laughs> yeah. He froze. froze. I guess we'll jump over to you. <laughs> what was your initial thought when you got up early? I'm sure you were tired too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was a little tired, but uh, it was definitely worth waking up for. I'm, I'm, I really liked both trailers, but I'm glad I saw like the U.S. the the domestic one first because the international one is is a little better. It's a little darker. I like the the music more, but just overall, I was it was super funny. Uh, I'm surprised at how much they were showing i guess i really should be surprised but uh, so much bill murray and ernie hudson and dan Aykroyd and a lot of the ogs were shown in it and it seems like a lot of the effects look like they're as practical as they can be nowadays and i was it's just another thing that's getting me even more excited for the movie to come out i should clarify i did not dislike the first trailer <laughs> <laughs> I worry. I'm like, yeah, they're just the really good trailers. Like, not uh, even well, putting right. Ghostbusters really aside. Good. Just even even the last the last trailer. Like, they're just really well put together. Super exciting. Yeah. They're just yeah. They're just fun. They're to both watch. really great. 
you're both amazing and i did watch in the same order you did but you know i think that you're kind of right like the second one is darker and it definitely is like this is what's at risk <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which i like it's like set that up for people let them know what's you know the stakes are so yeah it's good so alec you completely froze up on us for a second but you're good to go now at so. the death chill <laughs> Yeah, so uh, my first thoughts. Um, I was stoked that the mini puffs were sort of explained why they were there. I mean, not necessarily, I didn't have to see that in a trailer, but like upon, upon seeing it, I like the reasoning because at first I was seeing those and they were like, you know, in the article that's going around, they're like, we're completely moving past the Gozerian era. And you're like, <laughs> when you see the mini puffs. And I was just kind of like, when I saw the mini puffs in the Afterlife, when they were revealed last time, I was like, that was the first time my like heart sank in a bad way about Afterlife. I was like, oh fuck, this is gonna suck dick. Um, I I don't think it sucked dick or anything, but it was good, uh, but not great for me. I still have mixed feelings on it. To this day, I would probably put Answer the Call on over it. Now you know I'm alone there, but that's bold. That is a that is a bold declaration, sir. I love Answer the Call. I really do. I just there's there's the one time that I cringe watching that movie, and I'll, I I bring it up every time. But it's uh just the Fall Out Boy song. That's the worst part of the movie. <laughs> Everything else I'm completely down with. I have no problems. Um, but I I'm more excited for Frozen Empire. I think Frozen Empire is gonna be way better than Afterlife. I got the so feeling that right know, now. I can I can agree with that. I mean, so I got up this morning and. I wasn't paying super close attention when they announced times yesterday. What I was thinking was like, oh, the last trailer released at 8 o'clock West Coast time. Okay, <laughs> Pacific Standard Time. So I was like heading into work, and I get to work, and like I, you know, just check a few things, and I'm like, what? The trailer's here already? And like, they went with 9 West Coast or East Coast? And I was like, oh, okay, all right. So I was See, pleasantly surprised there. I just went I to just Ghostbusters Channel's YouTube last night. And it was like they had posted it already as a yeah. premiere. So it was like when it premiered, you weren't going to be able to hit to the end of the trailer. It has you have to do the watch through, right? So mm -hmm. it said eight a.m. and I know that it knows where YouTube knows where I live or whatever my time zone. So I know that it was telling me eight a.m. here. I set my alarm for seven fifty-eight a.m. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's good you. to go for next time. He's the youngster. Yes, he understands how to use these <laughs> tools. They tell him how to watch things without appointment scheduling. That's uh, I, for me. I literally did the same thing you did, uh, Justin. I, I I am dumb and I live on the West Coast and I went, well, nine, obviously 9 a.m. PST noon Eastern. That's what makes sense. And instead, mm -hmm. I found myself waking up at nine to an Internet that was like for three hours. We've all known that there has been two different trailers. And where have you been, asshole? Um, <laughs> so it was kind of funny, but, um, you know, whatever it happens, uh, so sleep is important. I, I'm not young. I'm old. Um, I don't know how to use YouTube to tell me when things happen in my time zone. I'm too stupid, but <laughs> subscribe just, to I mean, the class on YouTube channel, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I saw these trailers this morning, obviously the first initial reaction was like, okay, great. You know, um, very very hyped up for this i love how we've got the mix of the original cast and the new cast here and it's all kind of like a nice blend um very much those extreme ghostbusters back in the saddle vibes like everything you kind of want to see there and uh just that initial feeling like there's just so much you miss too in those first viewings like when i started slowing things down like it wasn't until much later that i realized like oh there's a van with the new equipment in there like you know just because it all flies by so fast and you're like oh well, that's cool. And then um, seeing Garaka like a, I'm assuming that's how we're going to say that, but, you know, like we could find out. Garaka, what a Wookiee. Sorry. <laughs> no, I would just think Garaka like Mortal Kombat every time I hear that. And I'm I like, hear that yeah. too, but then I also am a Deep Space Nine fan. Like I'm a Star Trek fan. So I want it to be Garrick. Like I want it to be the Cardassian guy who was on the the exiled spy who lived on the Deep Space Nine space station who was able able to kill everybody but was living under the assumed alias of a tailor. So like that would be Tony, you you're <laughs> Taylor. Uh, but like, yeah, I, the, either of those would be okay with me. So yeah, that's fair. We'll go with Garaka. I think that's fair. How do we feel about the comedy level in this these trailers? 
that's to me I the most it. important thing that was missing in afterlife was the comedy element wasn't it felt like family level comedy like there's a few really funny moments but like this seems like it's there and like the sincerity well, on bill murray's performance really sold it for me yeah like, him like seeing like janine in uniform like it felt like that was the first take and like he was literally singer for the first time that way he didn't know yeah one of my favorite the thing I, I think I laughed the hardest at was when I watched the international trailer and he gives it, he's like, check this out. And he's like, you can have it for $40. And he's like, I've never seen I've never anything, seen anything like, this. like this before. $60. <laughs> I, I laughed. Yeah, I, I, I lost my shit. That was good. I, I've thought about this. I don't know if you've heard me talk about this on uh, Extraplasm, but we met Pat and Oswald a few weeks ago, or uh, you know, when we were JD Raymer and I went to go uh, to a comic book shop nearby where he was appearing for a Save Our Store event. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the podcast or not, but like this is real. Um, the cost of autographs was two dollars and fifty cents. I'm not like that's not a joke. Like they were like we're selling tickets for autographs for any of the signers inside the building for two for five dollars as a save our store event and so jd and i were like it's christmas you could steal city hall and like lost our minds about this we brought like we had no idea what we got there but we've each brought like 10 items a piece since so we walked up to Patton, and we were like here's 10 items we looked like total insane people and they were all ghostbusters things and he was like oh uh, okay great and we, and so jd asks him like can you put your character name on one of these and Patton looks at us and he goes, what is my character name? <laughs> and, I like, and I was like, you're Dr. Hubert Wartsky and I read Empire Magazine. <laughs> I was just like, so we told him, but in the moment I said like, I wonder how big his part is in the movie. Like if he doesn't have a deep recollection of like what his name was in the movie and it could have just been totally being like, I don't know because I've signed an NDA. So if you know my character's name, then I can sign it, but either was can't do it because otherwise I'd be making a KFC famous bowl out of this. Um, and so I don't know, like, but I, the point I'm sort of thought was that he may not have had a huge part. And so sort of seeing how Kumail has been slotted in the trailer, like Kumail is going to be a character who pops in right who's mm -hmm. pivotal of the plot but probably is not going to be in act four right like i think that Patton is going to uh, be important and pivotal of the plot but probably not going to be in the final act of the movie and not necessarily going, Ghostbusters, you know if you're going down to your speculation point though I, we, I think i've got his character figured out we both had this thought and then talked about it later but uh go ahead yeah, so pure speculation. So if you're trying to avoid spoilers, but my thought is that he brought that there on purpose to get it close to the containment unit, knowing what they're doing. I see. So you oh. think so I think, like that, I think he's the human. You think villain. it's that malicious? I, no, I, didn't I think, think he's necessarily the human villain. Think that malicious. I thought it might have just been like because I've said for a while on the podcast, like that my predictions, like here are the things that the trailer confirmed for me. If you want to ask me what my other like default response to the trailer was, was validated um because <laughs> my predictions about this were that slimer's been living in the attic the entire time although i've been saying that he was probably eating like uh sous vide egg bites leftovers and cake pops and coffee grounds and that the containment unit had been stuffed full of them um and that's why it was malfunctioning and i had said for a while that i thought that kumail nanjiani would play like a person who was a collector based off of the fact that he had all these sneakers and things and some of the quick fast shots you saw in the last trailer. And then when we got to this idea that there was going to be this podcast or like Instagram live thing happening in the basement of raise a cult where people would bring in things almost like antiques roadshow meets pawn stars, like, you know, mm -hmm. of ghost busting in raise a cult. I was like, okay, well, it would make sense if he's a guy who kind of is just like a dude who brings an item in because he wants to make some money and you know is almost in some senses like not to typecast him is kind of a guy who's kind of like the fake jedi that he was like an obi-wan does that make sense like where he was okay. like i'm yeah. a juxter but not necessarily malicious right just kind of like i'm here to make some money and i'm gonna so i think your take on him being like an uh, a, a deliberate agent of chaos is very interesting it's not something i would have thought of so yeah, yeah that's the that's first good. place i went with that um the other piece that I found very interesting in this trailer when we're kind of going down that road is that you see Garaka pull the horns off a wall, like has to recover the horns to put them in, right? You see like that on that gold plated wall. And to me, that felt like it was in yeah. his apartment, Camille's apartment. So it felt like there was something right. more going on. And like, that's that particular clip 
drew me back to him going into Rays. Because we see him going into Rays at Colt when the line's not, there's not a crazy line there. Right. Right. It's like a one on one interaction uh, compared to like how long the line was in the other shot. And also, it's going to be interesting was- to see. Like, because like the notion that he wants to up the price in the moment almost seems like that leans into like <laughs> just the guy who wants to be advantageous. But like, mm-hmm. You know, did he inherit like an, a grandparent's apartment maybe or something? And he's been living with somebody who died. And he's like, I can sell this stuff off. This is going to be awesome. Like, and that's kind of like throwing that out there. I don't know anything for real. Like, oh, yeah. No, what I've been it's just hypothesizing about for months. Like, what is his relationship to this movie? You know, so yeah. But speaking of those horns, the shot where it looks like it's from behind and the, the horns have been inserted and they're like mm-hmm. reforming and moving looks so crazy and almost stop motion like animated mm-hmm. it, it, it's just was amazing it, it kind of gave me goosebumps seeing that like it was like legit off-putting and terrifying at the same time yeah so the other thing i noticed in the trailer that kind of stood out to me just from an overall perspective is the effect shots aren't all done especially some of the cgi right a lot of that looked like 85 to 90 percent of the way there but it looks like final rendering wasn't all completely done um especially with a couple of the drone shots and uh, that um you know the sewer ghost that's basically going to be obviously we all know it's the opening of the movie right if you've read the empire article they basically say we open with the ghost chase okay right. there it is so yep which is awesome which, like i'm so excited about a ghostbusters movie that doesn't start with them having to go back in a business. just oh really yeah hope that, oh hope yeah. That after we do like the little contained adventure at the beginning beginning i hope we do like a a sequence where peter vankman walks down and gets the the barrel of a proton gun you know and then we get like a a whole pop song called frozen empire you know by like you know taylor swift or something with a bunch of naked ghosts like floating around like james bond basically (laughs) oh yeah that would be cool yeah but i do think that opening with that ghost is just like the real ghostbusters (laughs) because you know you'd always see like a beginning of an episode they'd catch a ghost and then you'd kind of go through the intro and then move along so i think that's going to be really nice to open this film yeah i'm excited about that but i i'm sort of been skeptical i admit like i I think i'm going to be the cynic and i'm sorry because i'm not trying to be but like i think that um there was that that same article discussed the notion that it was the biggest ghost we'd ever seen in the Ghostbusters universe, like it would open with the biggest ghost we'd ever seen. And I was like, no, 112.5 feet. That's the biggest ghost you've ever seen in the Ghostbusters universe. <laughs> right? Like that was the biggest manifestation of anything PKE. If you're telling me that that you know sewer dragon is bigger, if it's longer in distance than 112.5 feet, I might be willing to agree with you. I recognize that you know you are Jason Reitman and you are also like you know the the son of Ivan Reitman and you are also the guy who's essentially controlling things. And you're probably right, but like look at this thing man come on i have one of these already it's not a, that's that's not the <laughs> biggest thing it's not it's this is it, the the mattel collection literally did sewer ghost what 2011 um and i'm glad he's in the movie it's cool that he's gonna be back or some form of him that's way bigger which raises all kinds of taxonomical questions about ghosts and how they work but like <laughs> it's not the same one but like i I'm really wonder like how do we get to that's the biggest ghost and if it is like why would um, it be the biggest threat so I mean I can say that Stay Puft isn't a ghost it's a manifestation of a demigod mm-hmm. so there is the main but, but, but arguably <laughs> nothing in Ghostbusters is a ghost by that definition like everything's been demigods no. like is a magician all of the demigod. ghosts are in the first like, one <laughs> like Slimer's a ghost the library ghost is a ghost but that's the thing is like. Fifty percent of Ghostbusters movies, the main villain is not a ghost. That's fair. Like I'm, I don't think you're wrong about that. Like I, yeah. I, I fundamentally agree. And if you, by that definition, if we say it's the biggest ghost, I guess I just like right. I don't know. Like I have. A I'm like, if I'm gonna embrace. <laughs> if I'm gonna embrace, it is very much a taxonomical sort of technicality, right? It's, uh-huh. it's kind of semantic, but like. I, I don't know. I want to understand and embrace this idea of the movie being like the real Ghostbusters. And in that world, like, Stay Puft is a ghost who lives inside the containment unit. Like, that's where he lives. Yeah, that's, that's true. You can pull him out of there that's if they true. want to, right? So. Yeah. Bam! <laughs> I do love the new tech. I really like seeing the new tech in there. The new handheld wand kind of goes back to yeah. Hank Braxton's Return of the Ghostbusters. Yeah. Uh, you know, a little bit of handheld stuff there. Obviously, the IDW. Yeah. Um, 
I'm sorry. Handheld well, stuff goes back to extreme Ghostbusters. Go on. Well, that's true. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying in the iteration. I mean, arguably, this, like, handheld least... stuff goes all the way back to Dan Aykroyd's spec scripts that said that they could, like, just go all the way back to their hands. When they had the little wand <laughs> things. That, thing like, right here. Like a literal, mm, more like a literal first. wand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it literally looks like this, and it has the same amount of straps. Yeah. I'm sorry, That's Justin. I stepped out. Very blocky. Oh, no, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, I got a really good I noticed that too. That, like looking at it, and I'm like, okay, it looks like Janine has that, and maybe podcast too. Like that was another thing I noticed in some of the the trailer shots. Look like Lucky had it strapped on in the in the shot where it was. I think it's the international trailer shot, isn't it? Where it has everybody standing in front of the actor, uh-huh. everybody except for Phoebe. It looks like Lucky's got one strap. Yeah, Janine has one in that shot too. Mm-hmm. When I was kind of wondering too, like, are they going to kill anybody off in this? Because I've all, 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 and it's just pure speculation, but I've wondered about Patton Oswald's character. Like, does he get killed off? It seems like he's kind of somebody that potentially could, but I don't know. Like, I mean, they, they tease so many potential deaths in the trailer that you're like, well, we know you're not going to kill all the heroes. I, I figured Adam you Driver might, might kill deal. Bill Murray. <laughs> you know, Emily Allen Lind is going to show up and just shoot them all in the back of the head in the final act, and that's going to be like the most scary thing in the entire movie is not the ghosts, but the violence of human beings. It looks like well, yeah. it looks like Lucky gets pretty close with the whole, which was amazing to see the proton beam actually freeze, mm-hmm. and it looks like she's freezing, and you can see it go up to her eyeball. But then, like we just said, she's in that final if. if assuming it's like a final shot yeah but like that everybody final shot, firehouse yeah she did you there, see any so. anybody missing from that shot because i did phoebe phoebe's, phoebe's, phoebe's not in that shot mm-hmm. that's There's no way she dies well no she's not gonna die but <laughs> and i don't even feel like i feel like uh, for the story you wouldn't want to incapacitate her at all to be honest that's like you're no maybe you she comes that. and saves the day maybe yeah she's maybe she's the day. yeah like there's something about that though that she's not in that shot. That's so. the day at, look, that's the day at work when she had to continue serving her work side like road work that she's doing to serve off the juvie hours for all of that nonsense she pulled in Oklahoma when she pulled the proton wand on a bunch of cops. <laughs> that's <laughs> why. That's like why they're ca- talking to her so much in that movie, like, hey, you know, the, this is unsafe for you to be hanging out the side of a car blasting things because this kid's got, you know, history. She's she's she pulled the proton wand on police before. She's that's gonna- definitely gonna be on her record. What'd you yeah. guys think of Walter Peck's like uh, voiceover on the regular USA trailer? Loved it. Kind of yeah. confirming like my predictions. Like if you're going to bring it back, what kind of role should he play? As long as he's not a cameo, which it doesn't seem like he's going to be a cameo because we get that whole scene in that office. And then you can see him like standing outside of the firehouse in the international trailer when Winston's giving his speech. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking he's got to be mayor. Like that would be the perfect role. We got to have a, yeah. you're back in New York. <laughs> yeah. I have such a <laughs> fundamental disagreement with this. <laughs> I love it. I, well, that's why I wanted I, to hear because like, to me, I love William Anderton as an actor. He's, he's amazing. And seeing him come back, I didn't know if we they're going to try to go that comic route a little bit with the paranormal oversight commission. And, um, Trying to see if they're going to go down yeah. that route, but this seems a little bit there. But it did feel like the mayor's office. Like I that room okay. there felt mm-hmm. very much it, like that to oh, me. It's very much the mayor's office, right? Like it's definitely th- that. But I'm going to say two things here that may be controversial. Uh, one, I don't. This is not about William Atherton. I'm happy to, that he's there. That's fine. Um, that's okay. Like I looked at him at Fan Fest and told him that he is the interstitial villain glue that like held the '90s together, and that's true. The '80s and '90s are basically <laughs> paved by William Atherton. Die Hard would not be what it is without William Atherton, and Ghostbusters would not be with what it is without William Atherton. But hey, I you want cannot their... leave out Biodome. All right, he plays a great villain in that too. Oh, that yeah. too. You're right. He yeah. is also in Biodome. I agree. Um, and and there, like, even though Biodome is a ridiculous movie, he serves a critical point uh, of you know being a goofy villain who you can kind of like be like, this is funny and watch. But like, I <laughs> I'm concerned. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I'm not like an angry Ghostbusters fan who's like hate this movie. I see your biodomes. I see them. I understand. You know, everybody has their things. But, um, you know, my thing about this is more that I hope, and this is going to be a running theme for me. You'll probably hear this me talk about this when I talk with Jason Fitzsimmons about the trailer on Extra Plasm this week. Um, I hope there is a rational reason 
why he is the mayor. And this is like my one concern about the movie is that the last movie had like a two hour and five minute runtime. And people were like, wow, it's kind of long for a movie. And we, I think we all know as fans that like there was more, <laughs> like there was yeah. more, we just didn't get it. Um, with this many characters in the movie, like there are something in the ballpark of like what, at least 10 Ghostbusters in this film so far. Um, there's going to be a lot of people in this movie and a lot of either introducing characters with, with development or not. And I want there to be a rational reason why Walter Peck went from being a guy who inspects businesses for the EPA in 1984 with little charisma, quite frankly, to the mayor of New York city. <laughs> like I, I'm going to need that character development in some capacity or otherwise I'm, I'm worried that I will feel like he was just shoved in, in the, into this situation to be like, it's the 40th anniversary. And we got back original cast members. And if that's the deal, like I'm still not going to be hateful, but I'm also going to wonder, like, are you telling me the best story? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think what uh, you're saying. that's very fair criticism. I would say, yeah, to me, yeah, you want to have that make sense now. I immediately got mayor vibes, and so yeah, I think I think that'll work though, just because you kind of have another human villain. Like that's the thing with Ghostbusters. There's always some level of human villains in there, right? And there's usually more than one, just because you know everyone's got their hate for one reason or another you know ghostbusters 2 we had the judge and we had the mayor's assistant right and you know in the original movie we had peck and then you know um really who else is uh i mean the mayor was kind of up in arms about it even at the beginning of that right so you're, we're kind of used to having things to you always have extra humans that are doing the bidding basically whether they're mm -hmm. possessed and doing it or they are right. zapped or whatever, sort of possessed like Janos. Rowan literally kills himself to become a ghost. <laughs> or they're just upholding the status quo, right? Like Ghostbusters is inherently sort of like a battle against the status quo, right? Like from its it, it, from its primary points in 1984, like that is a film that goes, what is status quo academia even, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay, so this doesn't fit in. And so these guys don't fit into the status quo of New York City. They don't fit into the status quo of academia. And so they are not just up against ghosts, but they're also up against people who would stand in their way who represent bureaucracy and stuff. And it's just, I don't know, like, I, I don't want to harp on this because I feel negative and I don't mean to. I feel like I gave you a long soliloquy about like, you know, here's why it's bad. And I don't mean that. But like, even... Ivan Reitman at one point said at Ghostbusters Fan Fest in 2019 that it was kind of awkward that they made Peck into the villain, given that he was like an environmentalist, right? Like he was an environmental guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like well, it's right. what he was there to do. It's, so it's like, it's, I really wonder. Like, it is to us now, to you, you know? <laughs> I definitely, I can see that for us. Like now, I don't know. It's, it's more acceptable to give a shit about that. I feel like these days. It's yeah. it's one of those like where that's it's those arguments where people try to argue that this is the evidence that people try to argue that Go Ghostbusters is like super conservative and shit. And you're like, well, just because they hated the EPA. I mean, I no, I would argue that Ghostbusters is libertarian, but like, right. And I would happily argue that and probably point to a lot of, you know, the fact that like Ivan Reitman was a devout, outspoken libertarian person at different points in his life so it kind of makes sense that philosophically it would be there but like yeah i don't think it's it a also checks out a public movie you know so i mean i i believe it i believe peter venkman is a libertarian <laughs> he carries around uh thorazine <laughs> <That's> <laughs> 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 yeah come on yeah so is peter a scientologist in this movie then <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that seems like something kind of right going down that path. Yeah, it's not the Ghostbuster stuff that made Cortland give him that emeritus professorship in marketing. It's mm -hmm. his success in marketing Scientology and getting people to pick up Dianetics. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, and so I wonder how they explain him in this, right? Like, where does he come into this? Because, you know, they've said that Dana's not in it. That, you know, we know that may or may not be accurate. I mean... I think Sigourney's kind of said she wasn't involved with it, but that'd be a great way to say, 
you know, to throw shade at it. We've seen them do that in movies before, right? Just here, we're going to give you something, but we still want to have a surprise, which at this point, you don't need a surprise. I love that they're so open about all the Ghostbusters in this and like they're showing us stuff because with Afterlife, everything they did was like super secretive and you yeah. know like the trailers there in the background but you know you're reviving a franchise but at this point everyone just wants to see the action and i think they're really kind of giving us that in the trailers even though i feel like we already know the first five minutes of this movie what's going to happen like we know what exactly what that looks like already right um and then we have a pretty good idea but i do hope they're kind of some of the big looking scenes I think we're seeing in the trailer. I really hope that's kind of midway through the movie, not towards the end. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity yeah. for that. Right. Um, especially if the stakes are as high as they say they are. I, I think we're going to see some very interesting things. And then obviously there's some sort of a flashback in there, you know, confirmed in the trailer this right. time is based on the time period piece for the fire firefighter suit, which we can tell clearly what it is this time fireman. Um, and you see all the people in the background there. So I'm assuming that, um, you know, John Urkava would say that he hopes that that's like Tobin, Tobin, uh, you know, Tobin from Tobin Spirit Guide kind of running around back then, <laughs> like figuring the piece out. Like, you know, like that would be the guy that like stopped this before and was able to write about it. So um, it'd be very interesting to see what they do with that or how long that flashback sequence is. But you're right. They're showing off a lot of stuff in these trailers. So that just makes me think that there's just that much more that's going to happen in the movie that we don't know about. Like if, if and that's how big the movie's going to be, because if they're already showing us all this, there's, I mean, we've only seen what, not even two minutes of what's on screen. And we've seen so much in just those two minutes that to fill a two hour plus movie, there's going to be so much that they're going to be able to tell us story wise and effects wise. And I, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be great. I think, I think it's going to be, like you said, it's going to be way better than Afterlife. And I really liked Afterlife. Yeah, like I've been pretty vocal about like the things that didn't work for me in Afterlife. And, you know, when I just think about the general audience, not the diehards like us. Afterlife was a an even better movie for somebody like that because they're like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. But for us, we're like, really? <laughs> uh, did you have to do that? Like, we, we kind of got it the first time, but. <laughs> um i think with this movie you're gonna get some of that but it's not like well definitely uh unexpected what do you want here. yeah which but, is kind of like then, okay we'll see if she's actually like irritated she, a, she, you know if she's like irritated in the scene, trailer only shot makes sense for it but otherwise if she's just like answering the phone like that for you know like I'm going to reference that one time I was pissed off and answered the phone in 1984. <laughs> yeah, so that's the other thing we've got coming. Alec and I have been discussing, we're going to have a bingo card for the premiere for this. Um, and today, obviously, some of the things got eliminated from that already. Like yeah. Library Ghost, <laughs> like that's bingo spot. Like mark that on your card. Peck, there. Peck is mayor was on there, wasn't it? It <laughs> was, but that's not, that's not, I feel like it's way more confirmed than it was before, obviously. It's, Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not confirmed. I mean, it was leaked yeah. before. It was never confirmed before. And nobody's said mayor, right? Like, everybody's just kind of going, well, it looks like he's the mayor. And also, he's wearing a vest. And apparently, mayors wear vests in the Ghostbusters universe. <laughs> We're all just decided that's a deductive logic rule. Like, all mayors wear vests. Walter Peck is wearing a vest. Therefore, Walter Peck is mayor. <laughs> like, and, and so <laughs> we're kind of doing a little bit of that as a fandom. He could turn out to not be the mayor at all. You know, I mean, to be real. Yeah, he so, could just be in a nice office. So who cares? At with a cop, point, right? It's, For some reason, with a cop. There's a cop who's present in the back of that scene, which is the most important, like, casual cue of what's going on. And I just want to say this, like, before we move on from the Walter Peck thing, because I feel like I have been, like, enemy number one against Walter Peck, which I'm not. Like, it's fine if he's cool. If it's cool if he's in the movie, I swear. But, like, Tony's shaking his head. He's like, nope, you hate Walter Peck. I know it. I know <laughs> you it. Him. You hate him so much. Um, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Two the final thing I'll say on this. Two final things. One, I don't want this to be Die Hard Two, right? Like Die Hard Two. Why is he there? Why he just happens to be on the same plane as Holly McLean? <laughs> well, okay, fine. Uh, and two, you know, like I think if we're looking at him as potentially being in a scene with cops in the background, we should keep in mind that what's not been in the trailer, but what has been in a still from Empire, is a scene of the entire Spangler family. Spangler family not in flight suits inside a police station so 
like there's got to be some point where like they interact with cops as well there's a cop in the background of this scene i don't really remember like being in the mayor's office in 1984 or 1989 and having cops be around in the background people who were in the background were like a priest who was like lenny <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Um, nice to meet you, Mike Cardinal Mike, whatever he says, like, you know, this is, this is fucked up, but I got to go there because I like going there. And so does Alec. What about the nine 11 ghosts? Where are they going to be at? <laughs> you did the Titanic ghost. You're he good says joke with flight that. 92 yeah, just arrived. <laughs> like, do we got to wait another 30 years before that's an okay joke in a Ghostbusters movie? As a former New Yorker, I'm immediately insulted and intrigued. <laughs> like that's like on the one hand i'm like wow you went there uh on the other but hand they already like, did wow You're that's right. also they already true did go there like, with there's a, been a so much more if you were thinking about the number of ghosts that exist within new york city uh you know post 1984 you have this catastrophic event that is absolutely traumatic and arguably more traumatic and psycho like psychokinetically resonant than the sinking of the stupid Titanic. Did I just call the Titanic stupid because I had a whole beer? Yeah, sorry, everybody. But, you know, <laughs> like, there has been a movie about it, and it's kind of dumb, so. <laughs> There's been a yeah, lot of movies about Titanic, that, and I love Titanic. Oh, Titanic is fine, but it's also kind of dumb. Like, it's, to me, I like Titanic in the same way I like Biodome. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I love both of them. Both of them. Very uh, different reasons than you do. <laughs> I don't know. Just love them. I would argue, though, that the biggest ghost we've seen in a Ghostbusters movie is the ghost ship Titanic. Yeah, you could argue that. That's a pretty Ooh. large ship. Pretty big. So, people don't always yeah. think about those little montage scenes, though. Oh, I was about to say yeah. that other, the big monster ghost that climbs under the thing. Yeah, the Washington Square ghost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah, he's a pretty yeah. big ghost, too. Now, the only cameo I really want to see in this movie is Bobby Brown still working for the mayor's office. <laughs> <laughs> the only one I want to see. No, I want a fourth at Kurt Fuller. A fourth at Kurt Fuller appearance. He's got to come back. Um, you know, he's Walter Peck's assistant. <laughs> That's... <laughs> I mean, Peter McNichol should come back as Janos, too, right? Really. I mean, I would love to have him back in there. Just Let's bring them all back. Let's yeah, bring See, everybody I, back. Like, I like Peter Bruce McNichol enough. I don't. Back. I wouldn't care how they wrote him into it. It could be the dumbest shit ever. Where I'm like, I would be annoyed if it was someone else. But if it was Peter McNichol as Yanosh, I'd just be like, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, do it. yeah. <laughs> Let's have him back. Like, what's he been up do to? It. Like, what's he been doing since he moved on to the Mr. Bean movie? Like, because it's the same character. Just different do you think he kept the job at the museum after all of that, or do you think he got fired? Because like I have to imagine he got fired. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. The, I mean, the aristocracy. Look, if if nobody knows about the Ghostbusters saving everyone, then I highly doubt that anyone who was in the aristocracy on the board of some museum was like, yeah, no, he was an innocent pawn of a magician from the 1300s. <laughs> yeah, the Vlad the Impaler here. This is how we did this, and was loosely inspired by, but. Uh... Also, we as museum curators understand how art works. Most of it is haunted. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, I don't think that was probably the mindset, you know? No. And like, what museum see. are we going to go to in this? Do we go to the Guggenheim? Do we go to the MoMA? Like, where are we going? Like, what's covered? Hey, with where's this lab? This is my question for you all. I'm going to just, you know, throw questions out of my own now and just decide to just throw things at you. Where is this lab? Because I think the it's upper vest the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only place it could be. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm guessing. I'm I'm calling like straight up looking at the tiling and what's going on in this place. Like I feel like it has gives you like old school like aquarium vibes. I could see that. I'd yeah. be down with that. That sounds cool. Like it reminds me of like Penguin's Lair and Batman Returns. It's like the old uh zoo or whatever. Yeah, because it's not new construction. Like it, yeah. much like the firehouse, if you look at it, it's like here's these like tiled archways and things that you would never build now. If you were building a brand new research library, like or lab rather, you would never construct it 
and like, hey, let's put it in a tile room with all these weird tanks. Like, no, you'd build a clean room and like you'd build all that kind of stuff, especially if you had billions of dollars because, you know, you're Ghostbusters and now you have Winston and he's a billionaire. But like, I digress. Like, to me, I look at this as another repurposed building. Yeah. In mm-hmm. New Definitely York. repurposed something old. Yeah. Something looks like it was housed for like a zoo or something yeah, like, like that. Like a zoo or an aquarium, like something yeah. that was supposed to house animals or like creatures. It was some sort of like underground catacomby kind of thing going on, right? Underground like because- layer. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I don't want to see is I don't want to see like all that connected to the firehouse underground by any ways. Like, I just want I that don't to think be it's a separate be. thing. Yeah, well, they I don't take get that vibe they all. take Willy Wonka's little river boat on the slime, and mm-hmm. that's what happens. You ride on a slime river, right. really terrifying. That whole all right, I'm into that though. scenario plays out. Yeah, they open yeah. up yeah. Shakespeare's bust and they press a button and then they slide down these different poles. <laughs> And they go down into the new lab. And when they come down to the bottom, they're in, flight they're in their suits. flight suits. Yes, like <laughs> absolutely. This is I will give this in seed. If you want to tell me the movie is like the real Ghostbusters in some capacity, this is the one I'm going to grant you. Like there's just the button they push that causes them to go down poles yep. in their Batman they go down poles and then they're in their it. flight suits. Yep, I'm for it. I vote for this. And I also got vibes from watching this. <clears throat> um that that research lab is full of a, another containment unit. Because oh, yeah. You see James A. Caster's character like carrying a, a ghost trap over there to like a giant bread block that's like wide open. And it looks like it contains everything. And like that's how they separate yeah. it out into those little individual like viewing rooms. I'm not going to pretend that I remember which of the two trailers it was in, but I think it's in the international. On one of the back walls in one of those scenes, there's this bank of red rectangular objects all in a row, and they have red and green lights where the green lights are all lit. And it came across to me as like a bank of containment devices that were either designed to like be able to contain individual ghosts or contain a segment of them, like an array of ghosts, which does call into question, like, is that bigger in capacity? Than the firehouse or smaller. Like, I mean, and like, let's be real. Like the international trailer is the one where like Paul Rudd, like straight up says like, we should defend this place. Like, which to me implies like in some sense, the biggest threat is still at the firehouse. Even if the research lab contains all these individual things. Cause otherwise, why would it matter if they defend the firehouse? Does that make sense? Like, mm. so I don't know, but like, I think you're right. Like I, I looking at the footage there and like watching it, I went, oh, wow, there's like a bank of exactly same red color rectangular devices, all with red and green lights. And they're not containment units in the sense that we know them and understand them. But like they are some form of that, you know. I feel like there's a lot of weird parallels here to the Hellbent script. If the Hellbent script had like a, a place where they could go and dump off like in Staten Island or something where they could go dump off excess yeah. ghosts and stuff, you know, so the research lab evokes some of that a little bit. That's yeah, a I definitely do. Yeah, I definitely see that being an option there. So but I was getting some big video on my laptop was... from the, uh, the, uh, the contraption, the container that they had the orb in was just like the thing that Slimer was held in, in the beginning of the video game, like a containment unit, aquarium kind of thing like an observation yeah. unit yeah exactly like you could actually capture the ghosts they're held in there but you could still view them and see them and yeah can we talk about the mini puff that has his arm in an old school pencil sharpener for a second <laughs> yes because like yes, no can. i don't think anybody else has talked about this and it was the first thing it made me both feel old and also nostalgic and that like sense of like wow old tech no one uses pencil sharpeners anymore, but wherever they are is full of books and things that are old and archaic. And one of those mini puffs absolutely has his arm shoved into a pencil sharpener while one of the other ones cranks away at it because they are just bizarrely sadist and masochistic at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I love that scene. So I've actually got one of those old school pencil sharpeners attached to the workbench in my garage just because if nice. I'm using a pencil, I like... Those are super cheap to get, and I just wanted the nostalgia vibes for it for when I occasionally use a regular pencil. Like, why not? 
But it like was uh, the thing that, out of that scene that drew my attention so much. I'm like, wow, there's so much going on. And I was like, oh my God, they're using an old pencil sharpener. <laughs> I haven't seen one of those in years. Well, they're using a lot of old tech. Like Janine's desk phone, they would not use that today, right? Like, right. It, it Even just, the, the computers IBM in the PCs? lab. Yeah. yeah like babies. inside the lab. <laughs> It like, gives you the sense that the lab they've created, although it is a new lab, is sort of assembled from a lot of stuff that's been in mothballs. Like, yes. That like when Ghostbusters went under, all the stuff went into storage somewhere and they pulled it back out. And they're like, okay, we're ready to run the business. But like, they don't even have computers that could run Netscape. <laughs> they have, there's all these smartphones out there and everything in that lab is something that could take a floppy disk <laughs> which is really kind of looks like it kind of looks like maybe maybe they cleaned out egon's lab from yeah that's yeah that's what i was gonna say and too is like agreed and moved it all to new york and this right. has only been running for the past couple of years and this is how far they've gotten with all that that's what it looked like to me but it's Ooh. weird because like they have a drone trap so it's like clearly they've embraced newer technology but at the same time the lab has all these like IBM old school PCs <laughs> with like discs. green cathode <laughs> tubes and like you know like they look like terminal stations. So like what's like, there's an oddity there that it's like I don't know. It's I feel like I'm I feel like John Urkaba has used this like phrase maybe talking about this a bit of like cassette tech, like cassette, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, vintage and nostalgia. And when we've talked analog. about some podcasts, yeah, very analog sense, even though it's digital, but like. And I appreciate that, but it's kind of weird because it's like, how can you have a drone without having a phone app? <laughs> like that's, like basically, having a drone trap means you got to have an app for that. Like you're not driving around on the Ecto-1 in the 1959 Miller Meteor using some like big, like boop, 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 punch it up with keys and wait for the printout thing to happen, you know? So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I don't I think they're just buying like a regular drone either. I get the vibe that like they probably buy like... Because I mean, you can buy if you buy expensive enough drums, you can get good drones that have controllers and probably oh, yeah. can use an app as well. So, sure. But I feel like they probably hobbled something together and programmed it themselves. You know, like at least hopefully that's the vibe we get. I'm getting. I'm gonna be yeah. honest though. Here's part of what I'm dreaming for, and I know this is chaotic and terrible and like sort of chaotic neutral. The number of people who we know who are gonna try and build drone traps and film them crashing into the ground is going to be pure, amazing footage for me to laugh at. I'm sorry. That's really mean, <laughs> but like I, it's the next probable thing, right? Like if we can have watch build, build RC traps, somebody out there is going to build like a drone. And I just want to, we haven't seen footage of one yet. Yeah. I'm agreed. Mm -hmm. I want to see a super cut of drone crashes set to like the Benny Hill, like, da, 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 and it's just everybody who's tried to fly a drone trap and it just smashes into the ground or i don't know a school or <laughs> not full of people that's gonna, outside but that's like, gonna happen for sure but you know hasbro should have easily made one because if you look at all the uh, star wars drones they made around um you know the sequel trilogy there like it, when toys r us was still open they had a ton of different star wars drones that you could just fly around the house like really that's i whole, didn't know that yeah, there was a ton of them. They had like Millennium Falcon and like some other other you know crafts that you could just fly around and like they're like kids drones, but they would still fly and they're super yeah, yeah. lightweight. They just look cool. So like you could That's easily cool. do what you did with the 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 muncher RC trap that was never officially <laughs> oh, released. Wait, wait, we're gonna make the flying dick? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you be, could definitely uh, looks like they're gonna they're gonna use it on the the uh the sewer dragon. So that's very mm -hmm. elongated and bluish and <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say just remold that a little bit. Yeah. Actually, I think that was sponsored by Bad Dragon. <laughs> Do you guys remember um the uh the drone toys that came out like during the dark ages of Ghostbusters stuff where it was like you got like Somebody copied the Maddie collector figures. Yeah, there was Egon. <laughs> yeah, it was like Egon. Look, look, like Inspector Gadget Egon. Egon would fly, yeah. Go, go, Gadget Egon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, that would be, to me, that would be, like, the weirdest and funniest thing is if the movie had used those. 
like that was what was like carrying the trap was just like hey here's like quad egon they're like wait well we wanted to pay homage to him because he's gone and he's one of our important founders and he's a family member so every one of these drone traps was just him holding the trap like <laughs> yeah so another interesting piece in there you know they said in the uh, empire article that egon's not in this movie Yet they show the chess board like someone playing chess. Now, I'm assuming that's not Phoebe, but they cut it to make it look like Phoebe's playing chess with Egon. Oh, I thought that she was playing chess with somebody. I just wasn't sure if it was Egon. Okay. Like, well, I'm, it looked like the same chess that, that we saw in like Afterlife. Okay. Yeah, it could be. And that could be, that could actually be a good point. And that could be how she gets to be missing from the, um, you know, I guess we'll call it the back in the saddle scene. Right. Yeah. She's engaged in a chess it. game. She yeah. gets she gets tricked. So we'll see. But it's it's clear that um you know I think from Lucky trying to save her at one point mm -hmm. in the international trailer that yeah. going out get away from her you really important, bitch. you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> that, that's a total vibe I got there from that. Yeah. Yeah, big time alien. Oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um I, I feel like I'm I'm also glad to sort of see Celeste O'Connor like have a larger role in the ghostbusters universe mm -hmm. like i feel i mean we'll never know like there's maybe we will maybe some someday someone will release footage but like i always felt like lucky was supposed to have a larger role in the final battle of afterlife especially because the hasbro toy they produced had like a different color proton stream than all of the other characters in the line and stuff and she kind of like emerges from behind the door with this proton pack alone <laughs> where like no one else is firing at gozer and she's like bam and just kind of like begins firing at gozer in the middle of that scene and so you get the sense that like she was supposed to have a pivotal role but instead like she ends up being fodder in the final cut of the movie where she's basically dispatched and turned into a terror dog and that's the end like lucky comes back obviously afterwards but like her role in actually saving the day and being an effective ghostbuster is nullified by the end of the movie and so to see lucky back in a role of actually being an effective ghostbuster as opposed to somebody who for whatever reason with no experience in afterlife is given the, the task of tethering gozer you know like mm -hmm. Um, is going to have a larger role in a research capacity and potentially of being an experienced Ghostbuster who's able to provide like R and D skills to the others. Like I, that is an interesting character development. I hope we get to kind of see unfold a bit. I yeah, want it looks that like... desperately, but man, I don't know how accurate or you know what what it may how it may impact the movie. But if you go to the Ghostbusters Frozen Empire website. There's three people not listed under the main cast. Bill Murray, mm -hmm. Celeste O'Connor, and uh, Logan Kim. Interesting. Annie Potts is listed under there, and that's how I found out she was in the movie, like, confirmed, you know, like, before the right. trailers came out and stuff. Um, and that's interesting. But Bill I, Murray, I love yeah. Lucky, and I love podcasts, so I'm hoping, you know, it doesn't seem like they're particularly left out. Especially podcast, Lucky. maybe I don't, right. I don't think you've even heard him talk yet. And no, we haven't. Mm -mm. Yeah, he hasn't had any dialogue yet in the trailer. So I feel like we're going to see a lot of him and Dan together. He's Doing shown a lot. Yeah. He's, he's in the yeah. background and, and with mm -hmm. people a lot. We just haven't heard him say anything. Yet. But I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't I feel like maybe he's in a lot of scenes that are not trailer scenes, right? Yes, like he's yeah. in a lot of dialogue scenes and comic if, relief. Right. And if you think about how it, he sort of portrays podcasts in uh, Afterlife, he doesn't have many high action scenes in that movie. In fact, when he does, he's like a D&D &D player who rolls a botch. Like he tries to Nuggets. throw a trap and he doesn't do it right. <laughs> right? Like Nuggets. he intuits a lot and he explains a lot, which is interesting. Like at a narrative level, he provides a lot of exposition for whatever reason he understands what the RC trap is and how to pilot it well but like in terms of being an active ghostbuster who's like grabbing a neutrona wand and doing anything like 
he's not there. He's much, he's far more there in afterlife as a piece of comic relief. Who's like fighting off little marshmallows. And of course he's in my favorite scene of the entire movie where he forms a new friendship. And it's beautiful because watching two kids who are nerdy form a friendship is a thing I hope to do, you know, as an adult, cause I, I want friends, but like, <laughs> I'm kidding, but like, you know, like it's two nerdy people forming a friendship awkwardly. And it's really, really adorable and really cute. And so like, I feel like his character plays a lot of people moments. Mm hmm but not a lot of action moments. And so when you come down to a trailer, like you can get some one liners out of a character like that, but I do not feel like the though, action out of it. You know, I feel like with the way they've kind of teed up repossessed for us though, that we've kind of know that I think he's going to have a pretty significant role in that. And yeah. especially the, the setup to this movie. Right. And so hopefully he gets to hang around throughout the rest of that, because that was my favorite part of afterlife was the new cast was just so good. Like they yeah, all have like, like I, such good chemistry. Um, obviously a couple of them don't get a lot of to do a lot like Trevor. Yeah. He's the gearhead, like working on the car. Like do we, does he continue down that path here? Like, because like several of the shots that I, you know, saw in the trailer, like he's fully geared up and like out there. So right. Yeah. And he's using like, a He's coming one of the shots too. too. Like actually firing yeah. it. So. Uh oh, we lost yeah. your audio, Jim. No, I'm back. Okay, there, there he is. is. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I didn't want you all to watch me and hear me sneeze. Sorry, I, I muted so you didn't have to listen to my sneeze, and it was not at all subtle, and I broke everything. Uh, but like, I, I think that podcast is going to have a big role because <laughs> there's a reason why all the people are going to be lining up at Ray's a cult, and it's yeah, not his... Ray. It's not Ray. Yeah, it's... I'm sorry. Like, I love Dan Aykroyd. I love Uncle Dan. But like the character of Ray Stance, we already kind of know from the last movie is somebody who hasn't been able to motivate and do anything to take Ray's occult to a point of profitability such that we got an after credit sequence that explained this and that had Janine ex saying, it's really great that you've been supporting him and someday Ray will turn a profit, right? Like, and now you have this influx of this kid who comes in who's media savvy and social media savvy and can get the word out. And he can go to mm -hmm. Ray and is like, what if we just like had people come in and we just bought stuff from them? Like we could put it on the internet. And so I think that podcast is going to serve a very important point as like a causal factor as to why the narrative unfolds the way it does. I just don't think it's in the trailer, you know? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that he's part of the reason why this all unfolds the way it does, right? His show is like, getting all these people to make bad decisions with things that have probably been kept away in families, heirlooms and things yeah. like that for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Like people who were like, this is a scary thing that like spooks me out, but has been passed down to me from a relative. And that's kind of like, to me, like I'll, I'll say it again. I don't know that I feel like Camille Nanjiani is going to be a malevolent agent as much as he's just going to be a collector who lived with a relative who was also a collector. Just of a See, very I, different kind. I think that he is not necessarily himself evil. Yeah, he, but it might he be might more get... of a Janos type thing. I don't think he's directly oh, possessed. Oh, Janos. I think ah, he's more like okay. being influenced by something Maraca. else. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I feel like no, that that that's 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 smart. That's much smarter than I was being in the moment, and I appreciate that. That's nice. I like that. That's because well, yeah, I mean, I would. I think that would be better than having him just be like, "Oh, I'm gonna fuck some shit up with a ghost." Like, why would a human give a fuck about and try? You know, like. <laughs> The motivation the there's a lot harder. Yeah, I mean, my motivation is to turn yourself into a ghost. Just ask Egon. My motivation was he <laughs> needed a vintage set of Jordans to add to his sneaker collection. So he was like, I can sell all this stuff that was left behind in my apartment by my last roommate or whatever. But, you know. But if he's trying to get Jordans, he's not trying to sell that thing for 60 bucks. He's trying but specifically yeah. to get the uh, Heaven's Gate cult shoes. Yes, he is. <laughs> he's trying to get a pair of those. Those are, you know, really high in price these days for sh even shoe collectors. So. so i'm knocking things over as i sit here recording things sorry for making noises no, that's good uh i'm just trying to think of like any other final crazy stuff in that trailer for me that really stood out like we finally get to see some pretty good shots of pukey right and then we see pukey is like free roaming around later so that's fun pukey what is, is what do you think pukey is like is pukey an offshoot of slimer is pukey like a completely new entity like what what he's like one of the 
I get slimer, the vibe that it's just like, another similar slimer yeah. muncher similar class, class type. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like that type of ghost that doesn't resemble its former class existence as six. much. <laughs> yeah. Now like, the, the other really it doesn't have cool legs. Thing. Yeah. Oh, well, it, it looks I like, mean, it I don't know. Does legs, it? But it's, it looks like it may have like short, it's really. Yeah. Like, if if it does are really small. Are you all, are any of you doctor who fans? Uh, No. I All like right, Doctor Who. I'm not a super nerd about it, but I have watched, I don't know, maybe probably 30 episodes to 40 episodes of the original like run, and then I watched probably all the David Tennant and Peter Capaldi ones. Cool. Um, do you do you recall the Adipose? I don't. <laughs> it's been like 10 hey, years since I watched. The Adipose were these small little walking piles of fat. <laughs> they essentially was like there was some alien race that was trying to spawn spoilers doctor who fans if you haven't if you don't know this uh but like there was a race of aliens that would procreate by seeding a planet uh and using the tissue of other beings to create their offspring and so there was a company that was essentially created called adipose that would Essentially, you'd eat the pills, and the fat marketing was the fat just walks away, and it was little like little cartoon little like pudgy guys with little feet who walked away, who were made of tiny human fat, and they would literally just walk away because they're gonna go to a spaceship and go be like new beings for an entirely new race. Pukey reminds me of an evil adipose. He's like the design to me is like looking in an ad pose and then being like, how would you feed it after midnight? Like that to me is pukey. So Dr. Who fans out there, you may get this for everybody else on this podcast is looking at me all crazy on webcam yeah. right now. I'm sorry. I wasted your time, but no, 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 no it's good. That totally <laughs> I happens. like that association, right? That's worth like something to looking into. So the other thing I saw people talking about just kind of generally on the internet, like I didn't go too crazy deep, but people are like, what's with that new proton pack design? And, I think the scene they're talking about is where the cyclotron cover is off and you can mm -hmm. just kind of see in the inside of it. And that's clearly what it is when I was going through the stills of it. And so, just well, yeah, confirm, again, that's, I feel like people who are asking that are not as insane as us. That's all. They yeah. live more yeah, normal sure. lives where they don't obsess over movies and uh, things, or maybe they do. They just obsess over different ones. I don't know. Yeah. But it's cool to see just in yeah. general, like a proton pack being it looks like being used and firing probably without the cyclotron cover on and it the cyclotron in full go and sparks flying out of it and it's something new and fresh we haven't really seen yet so everyone around them is getting cancer no i'm sorry that's <laughs> fucked up um <laughs> well, skin's make burning more. off and everybody gets yeah. blisters that's close to it <laughs> reminds me of uh egon when he's backing away in the elevator after he switches the <laughs> proton yeah. pack on <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other things that that'll be on the bingo card and we're not you know afraid to talk about it is does this all go back to normal do people that die in this movie stay dead or does it go back to normal because no 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 mm. not 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 do people do that die because there's a just there, i guarantee there's going to be people that die there's a distinction between yes. people dying and then people getting frozen the people that are frozen who don't break or get, you know, whatever, like sub zero fatality. Yeah. They are going to come back to life. I can almost guarantee it, but that's just, uh, you know, my thoughts. Because when you look at it, right, I rewatched Ghostbusters 2 yesterday. And one of the things that I'd never really just thought about much, but it just popped in my head was everything's going on in this movie. And then, like, they defeat Vigo, and all of a sudden, the slime has calcified and flights, flies away into the sky off the museum and you're just like the hell is that and you're then not you watch, wrong yeah that's, and you watch that's extreme agreed. ghostbusters and that's everything goes back the same way and you're like okay right. but to my point like i was debating this as alec earlier i'm like so in ghostbusters 2 not that any of this matters but it just i'm just humoring myself when i talk about this shit the positively charged mood slimes the only signs of slime we see at the end of that movie like all right. the bad slimes gone right because Statue of Liberty is still just kind of laying there. The guys come out that are raised covered. Janos is covered, but everyone else is good. But then all the bad slime just, like I said, turned to a crisp and flew away. Well, the only and, the bad slime that we saw, which was on the museum, we cannot, cannot yeah. or 
cannot confirm about the uh, actual river of slime. Yeah, and who's to say the river of slime may not exist in some form in this? That's because, fine. Like, you're baking soda on it. That's what fixes it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, who cleaned all that up? Like Walter Peck. And I want to know where Walter Peck was during Ghostbusters too. Not that it really matters, but like, did that just piss him off further? Like, I want to hear him being like, well, they ruined the goddamn Statue of Liberty. I want to see him like <laughs> smash shit in his office going off about it. Like just being so Walter angry Peck, that. Walter Peck only observes what was depicted by media or captured without his glimpse, like, you know, by others with cameras. Yeah. So like in Ghostbusters 2, he firmly believes that Lewis Tully saved the day. And that's why he's that's like, true. Eh, what are these Ghostbusters, these four guys? Of course, Egon Spangler said he did it, but really it was Lewis Tully. And that's what the rest of that scene is going to be. Don't worry. I want to see a so. scene with Egon, uh, Egon, Walter Peck staring angrily in the mirror, and then he punches it and his hand is bleeding, you know? <laughs> that's what I want to see. I need to see that in the yeah. movie. <laughs> yes, I think that uh, it's due for that. I just think there's so many absurd things you can do with it, and if they're not taking themselves too seriously with it, I don't know, like the, the comedy vibes back, but then the international trailer is a little more serious. So you're just like, I hope there's a good balance of this, right? I think that for me, like I love Ghostbusters too, but my criticism of Ghostbusters too is that they neutered Bill Murray in that movie. Like he was not able to like have his traditional comedy there. Yeah, but still like, there's some still of the really, some of my fun, the funniest jokes in Ghostbusters too that aren't directly inappropriate, but like they're inappropriate as fuck. Like, yeah. Uh, like, I'd like to run some gynecological tests on the mother. Well, yeah, obviously there's there's good there stuff green in there. card jokes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Like, tell me where I don't are you think... from originally? <laughs> right, like, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're never gonna get a green card no, I just, acting like that, pal. I just think that they they hopefully they figure out the comedy piece because to me, like, that's what makes this fun is like get scared and then have a good laugh. I Not think the I dichotomy, though, like you just you sort of just raised, though, like the sort of two polar opposites of the way the two trailer the trailers feel is probably what means that you do have the balance you want. Yeah, I'm hoping. right. The fact that you can the fact that you can take this movie and you can cut many of the same scenes, some of them longer than others. Right. Sure. Um, some of them with maybe maybe alternator outtakes to sort of build the version of the trailer you want probably means you're going to get what you're talking about, right? Which is a well-balanced movie because you can cut the trailer in this way from the sub from the subject matter. And like, to me, like if there's a reason why you need to watch both trailers, it's that like you will watch a scene in the domestic trailer and then you'll watch the international version and find that the same scene is there, but with greater uh, degrees of dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Or more context to what was explained as sort of like, Hey, here's a joke in the domestic version and hey here's a joke and a plot point for those who may not be as familiar with this domestic u.s film uh does that you know like, does that make sense like and so yeah, yeah I, I think, think that's right. can, I, I noticed one there's actually it's the opposite though it's it's a just a line of dialogue that's slightly longer in the original trailer and then in the international it's like cut down to three words but ray says like you know we're on the verge. We could be on the verge of a second ice age. And yeah. then in the international one, he just says, I think a sec or an ice age or a second ice age. Like, yeah. Cut like, and but like, you can see that like what that cutting is very illustrative of what source material exists. Right. When you mm -hmm. take that and you hold it alongside all the other content you've already seen from the existing trailer that is uniquely different from what you've seen, or that is just altered takes from it. It kind of gives you a vibe of like, okay, what will this film be like, you know, and what are you going to get? And so I think that balance is going to be there. I don't think that's a concern that I have of like, will they balance comedy with scary? I, I'm hopeful that like what we've seen so far is actually going to illustrate how well they're going to do it and yeah. maybe potentially better than Afterlife did. Like I love Afterlife by no means like, will I ever be like, that was a bad movie. I think it was a great comeback to the like franchise and there's definitely scary move moments to it, but like, there's not a lot of jump scare to it. There's not a lot of like, there's almost kind of like goofy scare to it at certain points and sort of seeing like these moments we see in the darker version of the trailer that show, you know, Ray being more terrified, et cetera. Like, I think that those are moments that are going to resonate with audiences and that that balance is going to be there. So I don't want to overread two trailers, but you know, you have source material. They had to both come from somewhere. So with the ghosts themselves, you can very much see that. Um, I think 
Because you have Pukey and you have Garaka, the op- opposite ends of the spectrum, basically. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. it's like how you had the taxi cab ghost or the minor ghost that are basically like zombies right. almost. And I really love the hyper realistic, nasty looking zombies and horrific shit. But I love, I love the silly, goofy, just neon colored sure. ghosts too. So well, I like, love the variety. I love- that there's just so much variety, yeah. right? There's no yeah. oh, set yeah. definition of a ghost. They're not like, yeah, it's got to be so confined to like this square box. Like it can be whatever you need it to be in that moment. And like, I'm not going to lie. I'm excited. The mini puffs are back. Like I, I know for some people they're like, why are they there? And I'm like, Oh, because they're a manifestation of Gozer and Gozer exists in the containment unit and get over it. Right. Like that's like, they're, they're going to be around. So like, it's fine with me and I can live with it. But like, I, I think that that's a good, another point of contrast, right. Of like, the goofy and the sort of fun that almost feels like they're, hey, they're like funny comic relief ghosts at this point, almost kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, like the worms and men in black, if that's an analogy yeah. you make, who we are drinking yeah. coffee, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you, like, coffee? you have way more scary aliens in the men in black series than you do the worms who are drinking coffee and who are like hanging out in the office, you know, it's like, so, and maybe the mini puffs are not going to be like, overly malevolent to the ghostbusters as much as they are to each other because that's just what they do when they drink coffee in the office you know like that's <laughs> who knows well yeah to alec point earlier when he's like as soon as i saw them in the research lab i was like yeah i'm, I'm much more okay with it that maybe you know that some of them weren't all destroyed kind of at the end of afterlife or whatever else that is but to your point residual pke energy like would make sense and they're in that area where there was another large manifestation of goes or like i'm not super worried about it like i get the appeal to them um, well, I'm yeah, let's be honest, the, 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 the mini puffs in general, if you really want to dig into it, I didn't think made sense to begin with. Made, I mean, you could argue things for it for sure that would make it make enough sense that make me just say, fuck it, it's a movie. I'm going to just enjoy the mini puffs. Sure. So yeah. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm at. But I do like when I saw them returning, I was like, oh, fuck again. Like, God damn it. <laughs> but but, but like, when I saw this trailer, I saw them and it made enough. I'm like, oh, they're in the research lab. Okay. That makes enough sense for me. I'm over it. As long as they're not yeah. essential to the plot and they're there for right. comedy and they're just like I'm hanging really? out like yeah. Slimer was in Ghostbusters 2, I'm, I'm sure. down with that. And uh, there's always this point to think about, like with that research lab, like that bank of, you know, five, six or seven, whatever it is, containment units on the back wall. Yeah, they might have made I've, those mini pups by exposing something to it, you know, from sure. the containment yeah. unit. Exactly. Or here's the other thing I've been thinking about for many months since like afterlife ended, like for this point years, there was 198 pieces of Gozer. Yeah. Where'd all them traps get emptied into? Yeah. They're like Wolverine. In the dirt field. No, they're like Wolverine too, right? Like Wolverine, they're like the contingency plan for Professor X. Like if he has to kill Wolverine, is he's like, because remember, Professor X has a contingent contingency plan for every single X-Man of like, how will I deal with them if they go off the reservation? And so the, the contingency plans could described in the comics for Wolverine is something like you have to cut his head off from his body and like sever each of his limbs from his torso and drive them all like 250 miles apart from each other or something. So they can't possibly reunite to regenerate as Wolverine. Right, like, which if you now think about the 198 pieces of Gozer that are all in 198 spirit traps, let's not forget that's canon now. Um, like, <laughs> like, but 198 traps in the ground, you can't put them all back in the same containment unit. If you did, you'd have a super deity who's like back in your metal containment box full of lasers, hoping that's just as effect as effective as your four little beams were that cross the streams to get it into you know, dissipating in the first place and then being sucked into not 198 boxes. So uh, that to me is like, you're always going to have resonance. Like if you Mm -hmm. have 198 pieces of Gozer, you have to keep separate or at least some of them. You're always going to have some sort of leakage, you know? You're making me think of drool, the dog faced goblin. You remember the Mm -hmm. end of that episode? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the two ghosts are fused together permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting. It's like it's like the opposite problem, but similar. So another thing I really liked about like the um, actual universe here. You froze briefly there, but yeah, we kind of got what you're He's talking back. about. <laughs> so one of the things the that I really killed. liked about the trailer is that you know up in the attic you see some Ghostbusters two advertising signs like boxes and stuff, and you oh, see yeah. Ghostbusters one boxes and stuff, and so. To me, like those are the kind of member berries that are just like 
laying out the story that all this shit's just lying around. Like when they left the fireplace, they just left everything and it just sat there. Well, it makes me wonder if they ever really lost ownership of the firehouse. Mm -hmm. Like I know that Ray says it's a Starbucks now. And I feel like that is a line that like resonates in the Ghostbusters franchise that if you could just erase, it would make things a lot easier. Yeah. (laughs) You know, but like, it would make sense if like, Oh, they went out of business, but they still own the firehouse. Right. Like, so they just stored their stuff in it. And then that's why their arcade machines could come out of storage and why any of the things that we see in the Ghostbusters firehouse yeah. the last year could just suddenly exist again. Right. Like exist. But like that to me is what's kind of odd. Like, I think that's where like my sticking point is I need that backstory. I need to know where the firehouse was. If the plot, if the code name of this movie was firehouse, I need that. Like I, this may be a bold thing to say on your podcast and I'm sorry if it is, but I think this could be like the last ride of the firehouse. We've talked about that before. I mean, but at the same time, the Mount, I say yes to that, but then my, my counterpoint to that is the fact that Sony built that set, shipped it over here to Atlanta and reused it. So now they don't have to rely on shooting in New York and they've got that sure. set and it's like, or LA they need in, it. or yeah. LA, like in, in LA where like you're trying to access that firehouse that you can't use anymore. Right. But yeah. like, but by the same token, like I really think that if the movie's about defending this place, there is the potentiality that like what we lose is not a ghostbuster. Yeah. But we lose the firehouse. Like they will win the battle, but they will lose the fortress in the process. Right. And like, this is a building that to be real, like from the first movie, they've blown through all three floors of, and the roof. We never got an explanation (laughs) in ghostbusters two of how it is. The place got put back together, but like literally from the basement up, we watched a destructive rift, travel through the entire building Jan- mm-hmm. including janine's desk and probably the orange thing but like, <laughs> like you know <laughs> the, pool, the pool table you know like all these things that we then saw again in ghostbusters 2 that were just back the table where they ate chinese food was totally fine and, and so to me it's like i wonder if this will be the end of the firehouse itself you know i, I th- kind of lost my train of thought here and i admit it and I'm bad at doing live podcasting for this reason because I forget what I'm talking about. But like, I think that that's a thing to really consider Like the stakes here, are not just like you may have a character who passes away, but you may literally lose the firehouse, which opens the door for this research lab and all these other things they may do with it. Right. But like, yeah, well, it's like the Avengers tower, right? I, yeah. mean, I think it's like, yeah, that doesn't define who they are. Like we all, we all do that, but it opens up the possibility for other things going forward. Right. You're not, you're not limited to this one spot. Justin, you just figured it out. That's why Patton Oswald is in this movie and why is a lanyard? Because what's happening next is they're all moving onto a plane like Agents of mm-hmm. S.H.I.E.L.D. And they're just going to yes, fly around exactly. the plane all of the time, expending <laughs> fuel all mm-hmm. the time in a helicarrier that just flies over <laughs> the entire world fighting ghosts. I mean, that throwaway line in Afterlife, I feel like you got to take his race sarcasm and like yeah, you can disconnect take it as from a reality. Joke. But I also think that, you know, you got to go the Ghostbusters, extreme Ghostbusters route. Like, right, somebody was hanging on to it or owning it just for the, the containment unit. That sure. that factor alone just makes it required that, right. yeah, maybe it I did turn like, into yeah. Starbucks, but maybe he leased it out for a little bit. You know, maybe right. he went well, to the thing. Like, they would have to keep it to keep the containment unit for that rationale, exactly for that rationale. Like, and thank you for reminding me that, like, what I was trying to get at was, like, th- if this is the end of the firehouse... You have to give it its swan song. Like there Mm -hmm. is this background story about whatever's going on with these firefighters in the 19th century, it seems right. Which means we got to get some, some story of the firehouse that gives the firehouse its day. Like you can't just burn down the bat cave without explaining. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Just thinking thinking about the firemen in there. Like that is very reminiscent of the firefighter photo that's in the back of the firehouse in Venkman's office, right? So it all goes hand in hand to that. I think that's right. something that we haven't exactly. really thought yeah. too much in depth about what what could be that flashback within this firehouse. Maybe this firehouse has a history of psychic turbulence. <laughs> right. And they you just know? happen to, like, by, because everything happens for a reason, call yep. it fate, call it luck, call it karma. This is the firehouse they ended up being taken to by a realtor that Ray was completely enamored with. And because he was going to provide the third mortgage down payment money, 
to make sure that they could ride that fire pole. <laughs> like they ended well, up there. And that know. could, you know, be part of like why they were drawn to it to begin with. Right. You know, right. So right. they just like the pole. That's the only reason why they, <laughs> you gotta try it. You gotta try that pole. Yeah. Ray like that. Pole. Does, uh, pole still work. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah that's on alex only fan so, so that's the name of my um my after dark podcast yeah. by the way this is when i eventually work. create my patreon no it's gonna be called you gotta try this poll that's gonna be the name of my podcast i was about to say i need to make like a like a sick ass hip-hop song with a bunch of these samples of ghostbusters and it'll sound like you know one of these really sexy songs that you play in a strip club <laughs> you just have those those oh, yeah. in it. Just use those quotes in there instead. You gotta try this. You gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta he try. Slimed me. He, 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 he slimed me. He slimed me. He slimed. He slimed me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like you bringing that element up though, because Why when we're looking at with the firemen, me? you think like, is that take place in the firehouse? Right. I haven't like really tried to hone in on the background going on in that room yet but now that i'm thinking about it, i'm like that's the next thing i'm going to do is try to look around for some context clues in there yeah i think it's inside the firehouse like so I, but let's be real like if it is if the movie's code name was firehouse because it's the end of the firehouse i'm not going to say i didn't sort of call this i've been saying for a while on extraplasm that like Eventually, eventually even Star Trek has to blow up the Enterprise, right? And how many times have they blown up the Enterprise? So, mm -hmm. like, I originally said when they first talked about this movie that what might blow up was the Ecto One. I said yeah. you got to get you got to burn down Ecto One to create something new because the fifty nine miller meteor just doesn't canonically continue to make sense. And I joked about how it would be a sprinter van, and then lo and behold, we have a van. But like, <laughs> I, 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 you know, hey. Ghost Corps, you want you want you want to throw some money down on this? I'm kidding, but like, I uh, I think that it's kind of interesting to think about where Ghostbusters goes for the future and whether or not the firehouse continues to be a thing. You know, is that the reason why this is the code name of the movie? Is because this is the firehouse's last ride? Um, well, even if it's not, like you could still destroy this completely and then just do something new there and still kind of pretend that it's in sure. the same spot. Like it just gives you right. options to not limit yourself to that. Right. And that's, I mean, which is an intri intriguing prospect, right? Like I love hook and ladder eight. Like this is by no disrespect, of course, to like the ghostbusters firehouse. And I don't want them to necessarily leave the firehouse because to me, it's like deciding that he man doesn't go to castle Grayskull anymore. Instead, he goes to some other place because castle Grayskull got run into the ground and that's just it. But you know, or Batman like, but, but Batman can rebuild the bat cave. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Like you can put yeah. the bat cave under Wayne Manor, or you can decide that you're going to have a secret sub bat cave, you know, in a, a clock tower somewhere that is your secondary bat cave, or you can decide that you're having a weapons cache underneath the streets of Gotham city that unfortunately Bane decides to invade depending upon what universe you're in. But like the bat cave doesn't necessarily have to be the location of the bat cave in the Batman universe. And it kind of makes me wonder like if that's where we're headed, like that ghostbusters is going to move out of the firehouse by hook or by crook, you know? Yeah. It, it opens well, yeah, up the possibility about it right there. To the international I was just say, as a quick note, Dark Knight, right? Uh, you know, Dark Knight, the Batman Bat Cave is not a Bat Cave. It's moved. It's in that weird little lit room, but it still works yeah. just as a Bat Cave. You're not like right. super aware and you're not like, holy shit, this is not a Bat Cave. I'm pissed. Right. Right. <laughs> you're not going, hey, he doesn't have like a, a weird lazy Susan that turns his car around and circles. Why aren't there bats flying at? around? <laughs> Why is he not eating cold <laughs> soup? <laughs> why isn't there an old man bringing him diet coke oh wait that was a commercial i'm confused <laughs> he has a rather distinct vehicle <laughs> we seem to be down to our last diet coke <laughs> yeah so i i just was so hyped to see these trailers today i had a really good discussion with everybody but i think we've kind of circled around everything otherwise we could spec i could talk to you guys for hours, hours oh yeah hours there's yeah. so much in both of these trailers it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah i think the big piece is though you know expect our bingo card before the movie comes out like if you're going to be at the premiere which we're planning on being at assuming they have one and all that good stuff uh that's that's going to be one of the things that we have now you know last time we gave out some goodie bags that's 
part of our game plan this time and uh really just kind of seeing what else we can do with it uh i think there's so many fun in movie things in there like even just seeing the posters flyers on raise a cult showing that hey you know there's live music here on fridays like ray's doing everything he can to keep that place open and like clearly whatever the hell podcast does is like what makes that a viable option in this movie and like really starts to carry the story in here but i think there's so many other things in there and if a lot of the things we're thinking about and speculating on come true i think we're in for a really good film do you realize how many goth bands probably come out to those open mic nights i'm sure <laughs> every like everyone that's like I feel like the uh, a Bauhaus cover it's a scene band. In out. It's a scene in Independence Day where you see, you know, I mean, there's going to be millions of frightened of people out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I am this goth band you speak of. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, uh, let's give a shout out here real quick. So thanks to Jim Maritato from the Extraplasm podcast. Uh, your social is just at Extraplasm, right? Yeah, if you you're on uh, Instagram you? or X, it's Extraplasm. If you're on Facebook, search for Extraplasm Podcast. And if you're on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash at Extraplasm. Uh, and of course, you can always hit me at, via email via the most archaic form of internet communication at extraplasmpodcast at gmail.com. Awesome. And then Tony with Phantasm Toys, uh, what's uh, the best way for everyone to find you? Just at Phantasm Toys across social media? Oh yeah, Phantasm Toys. Most of our posts primarily on Instagram, but we we're all over the place, Facebook and all that good stuff. And uh keep an eye out. We got lots of fun stuff planned. Yeah, there's lots of teasers on there. So if you're not following these fellows, just jump on there and check it out. But uh really appreciate hey, you uh, coming on, chatting about this tonight. What do you got, Alec? Hey. I, I also have a separate YouTube uh for just ecto violence. I upload different stuff that's not podcasts but recently i feel like this is the only relevant video i've really uploaded but i did a brief history of extreme ghostbusters just like a seven eight minute nice. long video on kind of yeah, power cool. powered through the history of that nice. all merchandise and stuff super check that out. ghostbusters <laughs> yeah so subscribe and like and check everyone out and uh, obviously up until the release of this movie expect us to keep covering this stuff and uh Find us online. We're at uh, Strange Little Video across social media. I'm at Mr. West Studios across social media. And like Alex said, at Ecto Violence. So uh, we'll see you on the web. And uh, thanks for tuning in.